Masters of the Air by Donald L. Miller is a history of America's bombing campaign in Europe during World War II. The book covers the development of American bombing operations as well as the challenges they faced throughout the war. The following video is my collection of quotes from the book. These quotes are organized into three parts. Part 1 will focus on the experience of the airmen, Part 2 will focus on the moral dilemmas they faced in killing civilians, and Part 3 will focus on the aftermath of the bombing. In the opening pages of this book, Donald L. Miller writes, quote, This was an air front. From recently built bases in East Anglia, a new kind of warfare was being waged. High altitude strategic bombing. It was a singular event in the history of warfare. Unprecedented and never to be repeated. The technology needed to fight a prolonged, full-scale bomber war was not available until the early 1940s, and by the closing days of that first ever bomber war, was already being rendered obsolete by jet engine aircraft, rocket-powered missiles, and atomic bombs. In the thin, freezing air over northwestern Europe, airmen bled and died in an environment that no warriors had ever experienced. It was air war fought not at 12,000 feet, as in World War I, but at altitudes two and three times that, up near the stratosphere where the elements were even more dangerous than the enemy. In this brilliantly blue battlefield, the cold killed, the air was unbreathable, and the sun exposed bombers to swift violence from German fighter planes and ground guns. This endless, unfamiliar killing space added a new dimension to the ordeal of combat, causing many emotional and physical problems that fighting men experienced for the first time ever. In this incredible war, a boy of 19 or 20 could be fighting for his life over Berlin at 11 o'clock in the morning and be at a London hotel with the date of his dreams at 9 that evening. Close quote. The Air Force had to make their own precedent and their own strategy. They had no accumulated experience to draw from like the Army and Navy. Much of what they were doing had never been done before. This put a tremendous amount of decision-making responsibility on those in the air. Beginning in the early fall of 1942, American bomber crews learned to fight the air war by experience and experiment. Every mission a learning exercise. It was a special kind of experience, different from that of the ground forces. Once sent into combat, bomber boys could not report back to headquarters with intelligence that might reconfigure the battle plan. The killing was too quick for that and too distant from central command. And there were no reinforcements. Almost every mission was a maximum effort. The men who went in had to fight their way out. In the air, the crews were alone, forced to make their own decisions if the mission's master plan broke down, as it almost always did in the blinding chaos of combat. A general's decision never produced a decisive victory. In the Air Force, it was the skill and courage of small combat teams that made the difference in battle. They had power and authority far beyond their age, rank, and experience. Dr. Malcolm C. Grow, the 8th Air Force's chief surgeon, told intelligence investigators, these men are not interested in democracy or freedom. They are interested in their buddies or their team. The teams are the closest-knit things that you have ever seen. As Fortress Gunner Jack Novi recalled, I can't explain why we bomber crews, without any gung-ho attitude at all, would put our lives on the line mission after mission against the terrible odds of those days. Even when my fears were about to overwhelm me, even when I was physically sick, I kept flying my mission. I didn't want to let my crewmates down. I would rather have been dead. The equipment of survival tightened and symbolized this bond. Ten men were linked to the ship and to one another by hose lines and wires, hoses to keep them breathing, wires to keep them in touch with one another. Being in a bomber crew was one of the most dangerous jobs in the U.S. military. By war's end, 34% of personnel and bomber crews had been killed, captured, or severely wounded. For the pioneering bombing raids of 1942 and 43, the casualty rate was 50%. Additionally, 15,000 airmen died in training accidents before they even made it to Europe. One commander in a bomb group told his men to make believe they were dead already and the rest would come easy. The heavy losses in aircraft and personnel had a damaging effect on morale. A fatalistic mood had settled over the air crews. This mood was captured in dark humor that circulated through the ranks. One veteran of the 8th Air Force later remarked, To fly in the 8th Air Force then was to hold a ticket to a funeral. Your own. A group of airmen at lunch were talking about recent heavy losses. One of them remarked that if a few more groups take similar losses, their group might have a real chance at winning the upcoming 8th Air Force basketball championship. One of the main threats bomber crews faced in the air was the German Focke-Wulf 190 fighter. These fighters wreaked havoc on bomber crews, both in terms of casualties and psychological effect. Not long after the first casualties were lost to the Focke-Wulfs, a morale-building poster was hung up in a barracks with the words, Who's afraid of the focke -Wulf? Every officer in the flight group signed their name on the poster. <laughs> 
Bombers returning home from a raid were often so badly damaged that they would radio the tower for landing instructions. Bomber crews joked that some bombers were so badly damaged, the only landing instructions they could receive from the tower is to start reciting the Lord's Prayer. The emotional and psychological effects of combat were not well understood in World War II. The 8th Air Force lost over 2,000 men to severe mental breakdown. Army physician John W. Apple conducted a study of military service members in combat to try and better understand what was going on. His conclusions were sobering. Apple insisted that there was no such thing as getting used to combat. Each moment of it imposes a strain so great that men will break in direct relation to the intensity and duration of their exposure. Thus, psychiatric casualties are as inevitable as gunshot wounds in warfare. In the infantry, this breakdown usually occurred after about 100 days of exposure to combat. By that time, the body's fight-or-flight mechanism, designed by nature for sudden emergencies, became dangerously overextended. The Air Force did everything it could to keep its airmen in the fight even when they were dangerously overextended. Experienced airmen were difficult to replace. There were some skills of aerial warfare that simply could not be taught and would only develop through experience. Experience was a greatly prized quality because the first time you get into combat, you don't see as well as you do later, fighter ace Gerald Johnson explained. You don't really know exactly what you're looking for. Your eyes, if you just look into infinity, sometimes don't focus on anything. After a while, you begin to realize that you're looking for a little speck in the sky, which in just a little bit is going to be an airplane. A lot of pilots scan the sky and don't see it. They never develop the ability to really see enemy airplanes. This is why situational awareness, good eyes and a good neck, was often the difference between living and dying. That and lightning quick reflexes. Tom Brokaw would call the young Americans who battled the Axis powers the greatest generation. But in the first year of the war, some people questioned their commitment. In 1942, the social critic Philip Wiley published a widely influential book about the youth culture of his time. Generation of Vipers. In the late 1930s, while the armies of Hitler and Hirohito threatened freedom everywhere, American teenage boys hid their heads in the sand while he charged, riding souped up cars, reading cheap comic books, and listening to Sinatra records. They performed shoddily in math and science and had a horribly deficient knowledge of history and the world they lived in, 59% of them having failed to locate China on a map. But after flying on several missions with them, Tex McCrary found them the best that ever came out of America. They are the richest harvest of all American history, he told a friend in a wartime letter from England. I never knew they existed, or maybe they really never did exist, until the challenge of total war revealed the same high qualities that have always been beneath the skin of the American people when the time of great testing has stripped them lean. From the outset, high-altitude strategic bombing was surrounded by moral debate. Killing civilians was an integral part of the conversation because civilians were the ones working the factories and production lines that kept war machines moving. This moral debate continued on throughout the duration of World War II and is still being had in the present day. Masters of the Air captures the main arguments and justifications that were used to annihilate entire cities during World War II. One man who laid the foundations for American World War II bombing operations was famous U.S. pilot Billy Mitchell. Almost completely on his own, he relentlessly tried to convince the U.S. military of the potential of air power. Much of Mitchell's inspiration came from another man, Italian Air Commander General Giulio Duhay. Duhay was one of the world's leading proponents of air power before World War II. He took a hard line on the bombing of civilians. War, Duhay wrote, is no longer a clash between armies, but is a clash between nations, between whole populations. Any distinction between belligerents and non-belligerents is no longer admissible, because when nations are at war, everyone takes a part in it. The soldier carrying his gun, the woman loading shells in a factory, the farmer growing wheat, the scientist in his laboratory. The limitations applied to the so-called inhuman and atrocious means of war are nothing but international demagogic hypocrisies. War has to be regarded unemotionally as a science, regardless of how terrible a science. For the first time in the history of modern armed conflict, civilians were singled out as deliberate military targets, not only because they were valuable producers, but also because they were easy to intimidate. Both Duhay and Mitchell were convinced that civilians lacked the fortitude to stand up to vertical warfare waged with high explosives, incendiaries, and poisonous gases. The new wars will be decided swiftly, Duhay argued, precisely because the decisive blows will be directed at civilians, that element of the countries at war least able to sustain them. For over a century, military theorists in the Western world had been under the spell of the Prussian writer, Karl von Clausewitz, who argued that the supreme directive of warfare is the destruction of the enemy's armed forces. 
Mitchell and Duhay challenged this iron dictum. The military bureaucracy had been skeptical of Mitchell's ideas in part due to the lack of capable technology. No aircraft at the time was capable of such strategic bombing. His ideas also offended people's morality. Mitchell died in 1936, however he still made a significant impact. His ideas lived on and eventually came to fruition with the advancement of aircraft technology and the arrival of World War II. As bombing campaigns started in Europe, the Americans initially shied away from hitting civilian targets. For most of the war, they focused on hitting military and industrial targets. It wasn't until later that they started targeting civilian populations. The British, on the other hand, focused on bombing civilians from the outset. The head of British Bomber Command was Arthur Harris, or Bomber Harris, as most people called him. He had no qualms with bombing civilians and even relished it. Harris was once pulled over by a policeman while driving his car at breakneck speed on one of his regular trips to and from London. The policeman reprimanded him, saying, You could have killed someone, sir. To which Harris replied, Young man, I kill thousands of people every night. After the war was over, he said, We should never allow ourselves to apologize for what we did to Germany. His views on targeting civilians were the most extreme among Allied leadership, but certain Allied leaders shared his views to some degree. While speaking to his Secretary of War, President Roosevelt commented that Germany hadn't experienced any destruction on its home soil during World War I, and as a result was never fully defeated. It is of the utmost importance that every person in Germany should realize that this time, unlike World War I, Germany is a defeated nation. The fact that they are a defeated nation, collectively and individually, must be so impressed upon them that they will hesitate to start any new war. Too many people here and in England hold to the view that the German people as a whole are not responsible for what has taken place, that only a few Nazi leaders are responsible. That unfortunately is not based on fact. The German people as a whole must have it driven home to them that the whole nation has been engaged in a lawless conspiracy against the decencies of modern civilization. Other leaders disagreed. In reference to targeting civilians, 8th Air Force Intelligence Director General George MacDonald said, if such a practice is sincerely considered the shortest way to victory, it follows as a corollary that our ground forces similarly should be directed to kill all civilians and demolish all buildings in the Reich instead of restricting their energies to the armed enemy. The present bombing directive repudiates our past purposes and practices and links us inseparably with a dream and design of aerial warfare limited to indiscriminate homicide and destruction. After the war, a survivor of the firebombed city of Dresden said, quote, even in war, the ends must relate to the means. Here, the means seemed wildly out of proportion to the end. I will not say that Dresden should not have been bombed. It was a rail center and thus an important target. I will not say Dresden was an exceptional case as compared to other German cities, but I do not understand why it had to be done on such a huge scale. Close quote. The thoughts and opinions of the airmen who dropped the bombs were varied. Many airmen openly disagreed with the bombing of civilian areas. They complained to their superiors about being in the murder business and that they didn't believe in spite bombing. They referred to the bombing raid sarcastically as women and children day treatment. When the major German city of Hamburg was firebombed by the British, there were a handful of American airmen involved in the operation. One of them, Jack Novi, was shocked at the indiscriminate slaughter he had participated in. I couldn't help picturing children down below, Novi wrote later, but even silent dissenters like Novi remained convinced of the correctness of their cause. The mad dictator had brought this down on himself, and, for supporting him, the German people would have to accept even the death of innocence. In addition to feeling the bombing was justified, some also felt that surely their intent mattered. Yes, they killed many civilians, but that wasn't their main intent. Their intent was to destroy the war effort. Regardless of how the airmen coped with what they were doing, the majority were deeply impacted by it. Some were bothered by the experience for the rest of their lives. The specter of the extermination of innocents would forever lie in the back of my mind as I matured, recalled 8th Air Force pilot Bernard Thomas Nolan. While some airmen killed without remorse, studies conducted by 8th Air Force psychiatrists found that most men on heavy bomber crews could not tolerate well the guilt of killing, despite the fact that the victims were remote, almost abstract. For the most part, personal hatred was directed at German leaders, not the pilots the 8th fought or the people it bombed. We live with fear, but not with a consuming hatred for another human who, given his wish, would not be involved in this madness any more than we, radio operator J.J. Lynch wrote in his combat diary. But the more typical reaction after an ugly raid was to bury the experience. Some airmen were simply too removed from the experience to care. In the words of one young pilot, we go four miles high and let them go and haven't the faintest idea of what happens when they connect. Another said, I never saw any of those people, I never knew any of those people. I came home, had a good meal, crawled in between clean sheets and went to sleep. 
Only a few airmen had open bloodlust. A bombardier whose brother had been killed fighting the Germans said, I hate the Germans. I wish we bombed their cities instead of just their factories. Despite the barbarity and destruction of aerial warfare, there was still some humanity to be found. On one bombing raid, a bomber crew was unable to find a target due to cloud cover, so they decided to find a different one. They soon saw a large German city and headed towards it. The navigator, however, realized the city was Bonn. He radioed the pilot that they couldn't target the city because Bonn is where Beethoven went to school. Realizing they could no longer bring themselves to bomb the city, they flew past it and found a different target. Airmen from both sides of the conflict were often very respectful to each other. On a few occasions, those recently shot down and captured had casual conversations about the battle with the opposing airmen who they had just fought with. In some prisoner of war camps for downed airmen, the guards allowed the prisoners to remain organized in their own military rank structure, and the German and American officers would salute each other during the reporting of headcounts. In another camp, the prisoners were allowed to hold their own educational classes and receive Red Cross parcels for food. During the final days of the war, thousands of people in the German-occupied Netherlands were starving to death. The Germans allowed the British and Americans to drop food supplies from their planes to the starving Dutch people. At war's end, over 500,000 non-combatants had been killed by Allied bombing raids in World War II. 800,000 people had been seriously injured. 20% of Germany's dwelling units were destroyed, leaving nearly 20 million people homeless. Even though the Allied airmen suffered tremendous casualties, the Nazi leadership still did not respond effectively to the Allied air attacks. Head of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring, dismissed the bombers as flying coffins. He was also unworried about the numbers of aircraft America was producing because he thought that the soft materialistic Americans were only capable of making cars and refrigerators. Hitler refused to give the Luftwaffe the resources it needed. He was obsessed with taking revenge on the civilian population of Great Britain and wanted to focus resources on making bombers and special revenge weapons like the V1 and V2 rather than fighters. But even if Nazi leadership had devoted their time and resources effectively, it likely would only have prolonged the war by a matter of months. With Allied war production vastly outpacing their own production, it was only a matter of time before Germany was defeated. The German war industry still proved to be extraordinarily resilient in spite of the stress of Allied bombing. Factories were hidden in forests or moved underground. Production lines were also organized in such a way that destruction of one line would not impact the output of others. Destroyed factories and transport lines were rebuilt in record time. However, years of bombing took its toll. The repeated destruction of resources, transportation lines, and skilled laborers ultimately brought much of Germany's war economy to a standstill. When asked after the war whether or not Allied bombing attacks were effective, General Georg Thomas, the former head of one of Germany's major war production boards, said simply, Victory is production, and you destroyed German production. Victory is movement. You paralyzed us. Unfortunately, one thing that was less easily destroyed was ideology. The bombing proved helpful for discrediting the Nazi leadership in the eyes of the population, but it proved less helpful in changing the population's beliefs. That change would require far more time. The photojournalist Lee Miller, the only woman to accompany the American army from the beaches of Normandy to Hitler's eagle's nest at Berchtesgaden, found Germans repugnant in their hypocrisy. No one in Germany has ever heard of a concentration camp, no one had ever been a Nazi, and no Germans, unless they were underground resistance workers or concentration camp inmates, find that Hitler did anything wrong except lose. To Miller, Germany gave no evidence of knowing it was sick, even in the hour of its death. And here is where World War II holds a lesson for humanity. The Nazis did not think of themselves as savages, and that made them irredeemable. But as Orwell wrote, if we see ourselves as the savages we are, some improvement is possible, or at least thinkable. This concludes my takeaways from Masters of the Air. These quotes represent only a small part of the stories and experiences to be found in the book. If you have additional insights, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you for watching.